Okay, welcome to uh, lecture five uh, for ECE 203. Uh, and in this video lecture, we're going to talk about the spectrum of multi-component sinusoidal signals. So sinusoidal signals um, that are sums of different sinusoids at, at uh, various frequencies. Okay, so the reason why we're doing this and, and the reason why this is important is that in, in reality, we can actually represent any signal x of t so say that that signal x of t starts at time 0 and is done at some time capital T. Um, that signal can be represented almost perfectly by a sum of sinusoids. We'll see later on in the course what we mean by uh, almost perfectly. So, so let me just say that again. So if we have a signal x of t and it has some duration, starts at time 0 and ends at time t, then we can represent it almost perfectly with the sum of sinusoids, right? So we can represent almost uh, perfectly any signal uh, in the form that's written here. X of t equals uh, the sum of a DC component, that's this A0, plus um, a number of other sinusoids at various frequencies. And so the, the key here is that this is true provided n is big enough. Okay. So obviously, uh, <clears throat> maybe it should seem obvious that if we make n really small, maybe a very complicated signal we won't be able to, to represent well. Okay. So the, the plot that I'm showing in the middle of the screen is the, uh, on the top you see the time domain signal of my voice just saying the word hello. And you can kind of see uh, it's a complicated signal. Um, there's some frequency components maybe you could pick out. Um, but you couldn't sit down and say, all right, these are just from looking at this. The, the main frequency components are here and here. Uh, on the bottom plot, instead, we have the, the spectrum of this signal x of t. And I want you guys to notice a few things. Okay? There's, it seems like there's a large component to my voice um, right about somewhere around uh, 500 hertz, right? So somewhere right there and right there. So five, plus 500 and negative 500 hertz. Um, and the vast majority of the energy in my voice is below about 1,200 hertz. Okay, so that's pretty normal for uh, um, a, a male a male voice. So let's see uh, in MATLAB how we can uh, generate this spectrum and how we can play with the the time signal hello and what happens when we represent it using a small number of sinusoids and what happens when we represent it using a large number of sinusoids. So here I have uh, uh, MATLAB open, and I, there's a file, I just called it hello.m. So that's just a script file, and you'll see, you can see that right here. Um, there's also another file, it's called hellomalloy.wave, and this is just a recording I made of myself saying the, the word hello. So let's open this hello.m, and... You can see right here there's a number of things going on in the code. Most of this is just related to plotting, but the first thing is this reading in the hello, hello Malloy dot wave. Okay. <clears throat> so I'll show you guys what happens when I run this. Hello. Okay. So you notice a couple things. It's just these plots came up, and then you also probably heard the uh, my voice saying saying hello and that's just playing back with this sound sc command um, exactly what the audio recording was so then there's a, a, a number of things in this code that we're going to learn about uh, a little bit later on but the main thing here is this number n equals 1000 I want to show you guys this n equals 1000 and so the next plot that I'm going to bring up that are down these two plots I'm going to bring up a plot of my voice saying hello, but represented with 1,000 sinusoids. Okay, so let me just do that. Hello. And it, it sounds almost identical. So we should have two figures up now. 
And the first figure is the me saying hello. And this is this one is only uh, this is using um, a, a larger number of sinusoids. And here I'm reducing it to only 1,000 sinusoids. It sounds pretty good. It sounds pretty close. To, uh, as far as I can tell, it sounds identical. Um, but that doesn't, you know, we could we could increase this to 10,000. Let me just run that really quick. Hello. Hello. Yep. Hello. And, and actually run it twice accidentally. Um, Hello. But there it definitely sounds the same. So what's more interesting is, let's say we reduce this number n to just one. So now I'm going to represent my voice saying hello with one sinusoid. Hello. Okay, so there's the original signal. And sure enough, there's my voice saying hello with only, <clears throat> excuse me, one sinusoid. And you can see that that's the largest, the largest sinusoidal component in this spectrum. Basically, all I'm doing is taking that one, and sure enough, that's somewhere around 500 hertz. But now if I zoom in on this time domain signal, we have one sinusoid. Like I said, around 500 hertz representing my voice. And uh, lo and behold, it doesn't sound anything like me saying hello. So it's more interesting if we kind of increase this to, let's say, just 10 sinusoids. Hello. So there's the original. And again, 10, you still can't hear it. It doesn't really hear, sound like hello. You hear kind of a ringing noise. Maybe a, a little, you catch this kind of rise of the hello part. But, but really, it's indecipherable. So it increases to 100 sinusoids. Run it once more. Hello. And now with 100 sinus. Uh, play it again so you can hear it a little better. Hello. So now you can start to hear in the background um, kind of hello, but it seems there's this dominant ringing that's uh, overtaking uh, really what, what you hear. And you can see in the spectrum plot there, if you were to count these little dots up, there would be 100 different sinusoids. So let's go up to 500. Hello. Hello. And when we get to 500, it's pretty close. It's almost all the way there. So we can see that we can represent uh, me just saying the word hello with the sum of 500 sinusoids. Right? Which might seem like a lot, but again on a, a, a digital computer this is not uh, at all difficult to, to do. Okay, so we just saw in MATLAB how we can represent uh, a, a signal, an audio signal, using a, a sum of sinusoids. And, and the number of sinusoids that we include in that representation um, really kind of allows us to control how precisely we replicate the, the original waveform. So if that number n is big, we can almost perfectly describe any signal. So if we use enough sinusoids, we can almost perfectly describe any signal. So last time we looked at spectrum representations of signals. And I just want to remind you guys that this is just something that really you guys are likely familiar with, that you've seen. Uh, for example, in FM radio, you a lot of times in older FM radios, you'd actually see the spectrum and you turn a dial and that would tune the radio to different frequencies. So if you were to look at the spectrum of these, you'd, really, you'd see these kind of peaks and then there'd be some other things around here uh, at, at each one of these radio stations. Okay? So this, this main peak would be, think of the sinusoid at, say, 101.5 megahertz, right? That's WIBA FM in Madison. And then the actual audio, the information is kind of just a, a bunch of other sinusoids collected right around that uh, frequency. Okay. So another example, and this is uh, important in electrical engineering, is what's called a spectrum analyzer. And the spectrum analyzer, uh, or a spectrum analyzer essentially just takes any input signal. So the, the signal would get input here. Okay, so maybe you'd hook an antenna up to that or uh, some other uh, electrical signal. And the spectrum analyzer then just displays the spectrum of the signal that gets input onto that port in, in the lower right right hand corner. And you can see right this particular signal maybe looks like a 
a number of sinusoids. Okay, uh, we, you know, about five different frequencies where there seem to be a lot of energy, and. These are relatively expensive uh, pieces of test equipment. This one is made by a company called Agilent, and they have you know a ver varying range of frequencies that they can display depending a lot of the times on the cost. But these are usually used for very high frequency signals. So anything from you know kilohertz at the low end all the way up to uh, gigahertz, right? Where a gigahertz, well, one gigahertz would be uh, one billion hertz. Okay. All right. So I want to run through a, a an example that kind of sums up the, the the two things that we've seen so far. So one is this uh, addition rule for for sinusoids. How we can take two sinusoids that are at the same frequency. So if we look at the first two terms here, right? They're at one's at five hertz, and the second one's also at five hertz. So we should be able to combine those, those two sinusoids. And then this last one is at 3 hertz. So we're not going to be able to combine that one. And notice there's also a DC component. Right? So uh, the, in order to add up two sinusoids, the, the simplest thing um, we could do was basically look at Euler's identities, right? And then take the real part of Euler's identity, and we could represent that as a uh, uh, represent a sinusoid using just that real part of Euler's identity. But uh, if you remember, all that boiled down to was basically if we had if we wanted to represent these two terms added together, then we would just get some other a cosine uh, omega naught t plus phi, right, where the phi and the a depend on the phase and the amplitude of the original sinusoids. So in particular, we could write that a e to the j phi equal the sum of the sinusoids uh, 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 of of the complex exponentials with the amplitudes and the phases of the sinusoids. So that would just be a k e to the j phi k. Okay. So here, right, the amplitudes of the sinusoids with the same frequency are 1 and minus 3. So those are the a k's. So this new sinusoid, this new sinusoidal representation will have uh, in a representation a to the g j phi equals 1 times e to the j pi over 3, right? Pi over 3. Where that comes from, the pi over 3 is from there, and the 1, again, is from this leading term on the cosine. Now, the second term is amplitude of minus 3, so we'll just write minus 3 e to the j, e to the minus j, pi over 4. So I would add these two complex numbers up, um, either just using uh, Euler's inverse identities, you could draw a picture and just do vector addition, or just put these in MATLAB and, uh, and get these in, find, find the absolute value of this complex number, right, and the phase of this complex number, okay. So we've got to find the absolute value in the phase. Easiest way to do that is MATLAB, and uh, or you know you can use your graphing calculator. That's equal to 3.4 e to the j 2.068. Okay. So then, at this point now, I'm ready to rewrite the signal with the two combined sinusoids, right? So I, at, at this point, again, I know this A equals 3.4 and phi equals 2.068. Okay. So I go ahead and rewrite the whole signal. X of T equals 4. Now I'll combine the first two terms plus 3.4 using the A we just calculated, cosine 2 pi 
times 5t, right, plus 2.068. And then, of course, plus the last term, plus 2 cosine 2 pi times 3t. All right, so now we're ready to, to plot the spectrum, right? And the simplest way to do this is just to kind of remember exactly how these things come together without looking at Euler's uh, identity yet again. So we just say the first, the DC component, right, which corresponds to this here, that's just that frequency zero, so that has amplitude four, okay? So that's frequency zero. And then I'd say the, the next term, let's, let's look at this guy, right, because that's at a frequency of three hertz. So I would say at three, three hertz, there's an amplitude of two, or sorry, right, four here. At three hertz, there's an amplitude of, now remember, we wouldn't write two, because if we did Euler's identity, we'd get one half. So we get one half times two, and we just end up at three hertz, with an amplitude of one, okay? And there's no phase, right? This, this one has no phase, so we could write e to the j zero, but uh, that's of course just one, so we'll just write one. And then at a frequency of minus three hertz, that's a positive three hertz, we also have amplitude one, right? We gotta include the negative frequencies, and then out at 5 hertz, now we have an amplitude of 3.4, but there's some phase, e to the j, 2.068, right? And that's at 5 hertz. And then down at minus 5 hertz, we have this complex conjugate of that, which is 3.4, e to the minus j, 2.068, okay? So that's at minus 5 hertz. And that's... That's all there is to, to drawing the spectrum of the signal x of t. Okay. So I want to remind everybody in, in general how, how this works. So if we have a signal x of t and we can represent it as sum of a number of sinusoids at different frequencies, then we can just apply Euler's identity, right? And after we apply Euler's identity, and define lowercase a0 and lowercase ak and lowercase ak conjugate, we can just write the signal in what's underlined in green right here. Okay? And when we have that, all we need to do to draw the spectrum is I come down here and say the first component, the DC component, right? So here's the spectrum. The DC component has amplitude A0, okay? A0 is a real number. And then the next component, let's say F frequency F1, just mark here, and there's also one at minus F1, so plus F1 and minus F1, and then we just draw According to the amplitude, we give these arrows some height, but then they also have, remember, A1 is a complex number, so we draw A1 and A1 conjugate, okay? And then, you know, so on, maybe dot, 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 out to some frequency Fn, and then minus Fn, okay? Here's minus Fn draw all of these sinusoidal components. And then this, of course, has amplitude a n, and the negative part has amplitude a n conjugate. All right, so to remind everybody, we have the following relationship between the capital A's and the lowercase a's. So a0, that just equals capital A0, but a1, that equals, let's write AK, AK, that just equals capital AK over 2 e to the J phi K, right? And then, of course, AK conjugate would just be the conjugate of that, which is AK over 2 
e to the minus j phi k. Simple as that, and we can create the spectrum of uh, any sinusoidal signal that's represented with the sum of a number of sinusoids. All right, so the next thing and kind of the kind of the focus and the, the new topic I want to bring up in this lecture is uh, what happens when we multiply sinusoids together. And we can write that, just think of a simple example here. Uh, just say x of t is the multiplication between the cosine of pi t times cosine of 10 pi t, right? So this first term has a frequency in radians per second of pi radians per second, right? Omega naught equals pi radians per second. And that means that the, the, uh, the frequency, right, f naught, is just equal to 0 0.5 hertz, right? And then the second term, um, just by inspection, it has a frequency of 5 hertz, okay? So this, this term is at 5 hertz. And what we're doing is we're not, you know, we're, we're no longer just adding sinusoids together, we're multiplying these two sinusoids. And so the the question you might ask is, well, okay, you know, if we were to write this as a sum of sinusoids, then uh, what are the frequencies of those sinusoids? And you could just go back to your trig identities, right? This is a particular easy, uh, particularly easy example where you could just look up in a table of trig identities how to multiply a cosine times a cosine, and you'd get a formula for uh, what's often called the sum and different fre sum and difference frequencies. But these are right, you know, it's kind of a pain to remember these, and it's easier just to remember Euler's inverse identities. Okay, so here's a, a, on the right a nice picture of uh, Euler that I, I took from Wikipedia. So he had this all figured out back in the, the 1700s, so hopefully we can all remember this, right? If he had it figured out, you know, I don't know, close to 300 years ago, then, then it, it, can't, it can't be too tough, right? I don't know, that's one way I remind myself that it, it shouldn't be that complicated. So what would Euler do here? Well, he would just write uh, this first term, the cosine of pi t, as the, uh, this inverse, inverse formula, right? He'd write it as 1 half e to the j pi t plus 1 half e to the minus j pi t. And he'd do the same thing for the second term, right? for the second cosine at 5 hertz. And then you just do algebra, right? So we no longer, we don't need any trig identities. We're just doing algebra here. We would multiply these out. We get uh, cross terms. And, and what you'd see is you, when you do this, you end up the first, the first component, right? You end up with uh, e to the j pi t times e to the 10, e to the j 10 pi t, okay? And then also in this, in the, the, the last term you'd end up with, would be e to the minus j pi t and e to the minus j 10 pi t. Okay, so we can combine these two terms, circle that one and circle that one, and that gives us this blue term here, right? Oh, excuse me, I did this backwards. That actually gives us the red term here, so ignore, ignore the color scheme, right? We have these terms of course, you can combine these exponents, and you get e to the j 11 pi t for this first for this first circle blue term, and e to the mi j minus 11 pi t for the second circle blue term. And those, <laughs> let me circle those in red. This guy and this term, right? Those combine, and now again, applying Euler's inverse identity, give you that, that first term. And this term, and this term, these kind of, when you add the, the, the combine the ex, exponential functions in these circle blue terms, you get uh, a minus j 9 pi t. And so that corresponds to a frequency of, of 4 and a half hertz, right? And that's just this term down here. All right, so 
we, we see how we can use Euler's identity for other things. One is we can just forget all these trig identities and now um, it's relatively easy to, to combine, to multiply uh, sinusoids. So the final product is this sum of two different sinusoids. And the, the frequencies, right, of the two different sinusoids are 11 hertz and 9 hertz. So we see how, uh, we somehow get uh, two components at the sum and different fre difference frequencies of the two sinusoids. So again, we could write, draw the spectrum of this. That's exactly what we're going to do here. And we can kind of do this with, uh, without using Euler's identity since we've seen it um, a few number of times, right? And uh, the way we would do that, just say, okay, let's look at this first term, the, uh, the, the term in red, and we'd say that corresponds to a frequency of 5.5 hertz, right? Omega not equals, uh, omega here equals 11 pi, so f is going to be omega, uh, uh, omega divided by 2 pi, right? So it should be 5.5 5 hertz. So we should have a component at minus 5.5 and plus 5.5. Okay, just draw those there. So here's minus 5.5, and here's plus 5.5 hertz. All right, and the amplitude of that should be, it shouldn't be one half, right? It should be one fourth because when we if we wrote this out using Euler's identity, we get another factor of one half. So this should be one fourth. And we could write e to the j zero again, but right that's just one because the phase of that first term is is zero. And then we'd also have the same amplitude for the positive component. Now, right away the negative uh, or the, the the component at that has omega equal nine pi. So the second term written in blue, that's at four point five hertz, right? And the way I'm getting that is, just let me write it out. So if omega equals 9 pi, then f should equal omega divided by 2 pi, right? Which equals 4.5. 4 4.5 hertz, right? So now let's just draw those components at 4.5 hertz. We have one here, and say one here, and this would be minus 4.5, this would be plus 4.5, and each one of these would also have amplitude one-fourth. Again, it's one-fourth, not one-half, because if we wrote this cosine out using Euler's identity, we'd get another factor uh, of, of one-half. Okay, so, so what, uh, what's a, a solid application of something that can be used, all this manipulation of sinusoids can be used for in practice? Well, one application that's pretty interesting is uh, AM radio, all right? So everybody, hopefully everybody listens, uh, has listened to AM radio at some point in their life. A lot of times you think of different stations in Madison, um, be one at 1310, I think that's a sports radio, and that's, 1310 kilohertz uh, or 1.31 megahertz. Um, and, and the way these AM radio stations work is very simple. Okay? The idea is as follows. We have <clears throat> a signal V of T and this V of T is just the speech or the music. Right? And like we saw, we can represent that uh, using the sum of a number of sinusoids. So we saw from my, my saying, me saying the word hello, the number of sinusoids uh, in, in order to accurately represent that was somehow maybe about 500 or 1,000 different sinusoids. So that number you could think of as 500 or 1,000, that, that capital N. But the thing about this is uh, when, when people were trying to originally do look at radio and say, all right, they thought they could just somehow transmit the signal V of T directly. Right? And the problem with that is uh, these frequencies that, that make up voice and music are all uh, less than, you know, 
15 kilohertz, maybe 20 kilohertz for music. And, and the problem with that is that low frequency electromagnetic signals, so what people did, right, was they took voice signals, converted them to electrical signals, and then if you just try and transmit that electrical signal, then all the frequency components are, you know, less than 15 kilohertz. Most of the, the voices, like my voice, was somewhere around 500, uh, 500 hertz. So these low frequency uh, um, um, electromagnetic waves, right, if we just took that electrical signal and hooked it up to an antenna and tried to send this as an electromagnetic wave, the issue would be that these low frequencies don't propagate well, and they require very large antennas. So uh, it's, it's kind of a bad idea. It doesn't work well, and there's other, even perhaps more important issues you can think of if everybody tried to transmit their voice at the same time at these low frequencies, then of course you would, you, you, every, every, all these signals would add together where you're trying to receive them, so there's a lot of problems. So right around 1900, so more than 100 years ago, people were starting to figure this out. Uh, one, one of the guys who was kind of fundamental to this was a Canadian guy named Reginald Fenniston. Fenniston okay? And so he, right around 1900, did, basically had the first AM radio transmission. Um, and he transmitted a signal for about a mile. Okay, so it now seems pretty simple, it seems pretty easy now, but at the time it was very difficult. The guy uh, had some, some pioneering ideas. In particular, um, it was to multiply the voice or audio signal, that's V of T, times a cosine wave at a, a higher frequency. Okay, so we'll call that the carrier frequency. What, what was... Uh, um, Fessenden's idea that he brought to this was that they needed to generate a very clean cosine at, F, at, at this carrier frequency. And that's how he uh, um, kind of made this contribution and by using new technology to generate a very high frequency sinusoid, they were able to make this work. Okay. So the key to this AM signal again is we now have X of T. This is the, <clears throat> the signal that we want to transmit and that's just V of T, the voice or the speech signal, times this carrier signal. And the carrier signal is just a pure cosine okay, at frequency FC, which is often called the carrier frequency. All right, so how does this work? What does the spectrum of this AM signal uh, look like? Well, uh, again, we can use Euler's identity and just write out what the voice signal is. Voice signal, of course, is some of these sinusoids. We're going to represent them using complex exponentials. And then the carrier frequency, or the carrier signal, sorry, is just this cosine, this pure cosine at, at a frequency Fc, which is a carrier frequency. And again, we write that using Euler's identity. So now we really just have a, uh, a big algebra problem, right? So we have the carrier signal written right there now times the voice or the speech signal underlined in blue. And after a little bit of algebra, what you'd see is uh, when we look at the spectrum of this, again, we end up now taking that spectrum of the voice signal, so any sinusoid that was included in this sum of sinusoids that make up the voice signal, that gets translated in the spectrum. That gets just that, that whole spectrum together gets shifted up to frequencies uh, at that, so it's centered around the carrier frequency. Okay? And so let's just look at the positive frequencies to start. So the positive frequencies here right, would be what's written all this stuff. So we basically distributed this first time, this, this first term inside the sum, okay? And then we just combine the, the, the exponents. And then what you see is you get a, a bunch of terms, and the frequency of each one of those terms is now at the carrier frequency plus the fr frequency of the, the original sinusoid, the voice sinusoid, and 
the carrier frequency minus the frequency of the original sinusoid. So if you think about this, all this is doing is just basically taking that original spectrum, and here this is, the, the, again, the spectrum of the word hello that we saw in the beginning. And before that was kind of centered around zero hertz. And now we've just shifted it up by multiplying it by a carrier frequency. So it's now centered at plus FC. At the same time doing that, we also created this, this second term. And that's all of these components are in this chunk of negative frequencies, right? And so in, in order for this picture to make sense, I kind of Im made the assumption that FC was much greater than all the FKs, right? Otherwise, it, the drawing wouldn't exactly, wouldn't look like this. But when that's true, when that carrier frequency is much greater than all the frequencies in the sinusoid, we get something, uh, a spectrum that looks exactly like what I have uh, drawn below.